If you've not long joined us, welcome to IWM Duxford for our third flying evening. Very nice to see you here. Hope you've been having a lovely day so far. Hope you're enjoying the refreshment stands and uh, also I can see a good many of you being entertained by the gramophone DJ. Always a very welcome part of these uh, flying evenings here. And we're all leading up to the start of the flying display which is at half past six and I'll be running you through that again in a few moments. Meantime, some of the ground crews are positioned out on the flight line ready to be there to supervise the startups of the first three aircraft on the program. In fact, the first of them firing literally into life now. The P-36C of the fighter collection, that the P-40C and the P-40F, all Curtis fighters of the Second World War, will be getting airborne to form our first item and running in at 6.30 prompt to start the display, which runs through until 25 past eight. Back with you soon to run you back through the flying program this evening. With any luck as the evening progresses we should have some dramatic skies of one sort or another to enjoy this is one of the beauties of course of the flying evenings here at Duxford the orientation of the airfield is such that this is the perfect time light conditions wise to stage a flying display with the Sun behind us and we just wait and see whether or not any of the showery and potentially thundery activity in the locality misses us we very much hope that it does and it could very well be that we have some uh, impressively lit cloudscapes to enjoy the displays against and certainly that would be a boon for the two silver courtesies in this opening formation two of the most striking warbirds on the display circuit the p36c and the p40c of the fighter collection one of those combinations of aircraft that can only be seen at IWM Duxford and joined as they will be by the P-40F which also stands out very well against an evening sky in its desert camouflage scheme that our opening act and with the P-36C already running up the P-40C and P-40F due to start in just a few moments time
So the engine started on all three aircraft in our opening formation. An opportune moment for me to run back through the flying programme, especially for those of you who've just joined us here at our event this evening. We start off with the three Curtis fighters from the fighter collection, P-36C, P-40C and P-40F. Then it's on to B-17 Flying Fortress Sally B. That'll be followed by the solo Spitfire 1A from Imperial War Museums, not joined as we'd hoped by Jennifer Taylor's Hurricane due to the unserviceability of that aircraft, so a solo Spitfire. Then we've got the two stunning air racers from different eras that are parked right in front of the control tower, the 1930s Percival Mugol reproduction and the late 1940s Levere Cosmic Wind. That leads us into the Flying Comrades with their three Yaks, the Yak-18T and the two Yak-52s. After that, we've got a pair of post-war fighters, one piston, the Hawker Fury, the other a jet, our only jet on the programme this evening, the de Havilland Vampire the Fury from Fighter Aviation Engineering, the Vampire from the Norwegian Air Force Historical Squadron. They're followed by the always impressive form of Plain Sailing's Consolidated Catalina. Then we've got the Fokker DR-1 Drydecker, the triplane from the First World War, from Paul Ford's fleet. And we've got a pyrotechnic accompanied conclusion with the two Grob G109Bs of Airborne Pyrotechnics with an absolutely fantastic display to bring the show to a close. And we'll be finishing off just before official darkness at 25 past eight this evening. So hope you've got a good spot on the crowd line, ready for the start of the display, the opening act, getting airborne in advance, but running back in at 6.30 prompt. Just for you, Chris. Hello, welcome everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, slightly out of breath, slightly running around, tweaking uh, audio levels for the public address system here. It's not really a public address system, a tannoy system here, which is providing Ben's wonderful uh, narration commentary of today's air show to the people who are here live. And you'll obviously hear Ben and we'll have been hearing him guide you through what we're expecting to see today. And I've just been tweaking the levels slightly because it's not really cut out for this job, but uh, I'll spare you the details. Thank you for tuning in, everybody. Got the cursed aircraft just lining up. or well, not quite lining up over my shoulder. You can see the aircraft there. And we have, I'm looking behind the camera that's facing me, and it's, you know, it's just looking like the sun might just drop into some uh, thinner clouds. So we may just, we may yet get that lovely evening light that we all hope for at an event such as this. So. Duxford Flying Evening, uh, a, a lovely initiative by Duxford to put some of these aircraft up in the ambience of a summer evening. And it is almost a summer evening. I mean, it is a British summer evening, definitely. But uh, it's very, very still. Um, the rain, you know, there's a bit of rain, but um, fairly clear. I can see spots of blue, spots of contrast, contrasty clouds in the sky. So a nice backdrop, it would just be nice to get a bit more sunshine because it is behind, which is quite rare here at Duxford. You'll have heard, if you're a regular viewer, you'll have heard me talk about the frustration of having a sun behind aircraft that we're filming. Here at a flying evening, the sun's moved round enough to give us some hopefully nicely lit aircraft so you can sort of 
get a bit more detail. It's the stuff I nerd out on when I'm pointing cameras at airplanes, forgive me. But thank you for tuning in, and uh, I must say a happy birthday to Lima. I forget your full username. Uh, da -da. I can see you remember, so I'll find you quickly. Lima M Flight Simulator, a uh, regular viewer, and I spotted you said it's your birthday earlier. Oh, I see. It happened that Monty's uh, gifted subscription became your uh, membership. Um, that's a fitting birthday gift. Um, thank you for, for that, Monty. Monty's uh, been giving gift uh, memberships to viewers recently, and I'm very grateful for that that membership system. Channel memberships on YouTube, just uh, it's a sort of modest fee, monthly fee, and it helps encourage me to come and do a bit more free-to-view live here on YouTube. The alternative being the subscriptions we do on our PTV on, PTV on demand service, such as uh, Royal International Air, as you back a month ago now, a bit over a month ago, um, and the Ducks with September air show will be back here, gosh, not very many weeks at all. What's that, three weeks? Maybe a touch more? No, about three weeks. Um, we'll be back here live broadcasting the September air show, the Battle of Britain air show on PTV On Demand. I can hear some radio calls, so I suspect the aircraft are about to get airborne, and I'll leave you in the very capable hands of uh, Ben Donnell guiding you through the flying af this afternoon. Just wanted to say welcome, and really just to say, Hello to Chris, because you're asking... Am I and there go, the three right, I'll hand over Curtis to ben. fighters lining up on the grass runway. They'll be spending about a quarter of an hour holding off to the north, getting ready for their slot before running in at half past six to get the programme underway. And they'll be rolling in five seconds. P-36C leading them off. And then the two P-40s. A very interesting combination of different engine notes from those three fighters, powered as they are by three different types of engine. The Pratt & Whitney Twin Wasp, powering the first of the three aircraft, the P-36C, that's the only radial engine in the trio, the Allison V-1710 in the P-40C, and the Packard-built Rolls-Royce Merlin in the P-40F. Three aircraft that between them reflect the development of the Curtis family of fighters. 
that were some of the most important American-built fighters, or pursuit aircraft, as they were known to the Americans. At the early part of World War II, and not just in service with the Americans either, because the P-36C, the aircraft that led that formation off, saw its earliest combat applications with the French Air Force in the Battle of France during 1940, and indeed some of the first aerial actions on the Western Front of the Second World War involved French Air Force Hawk 75s, as the P-36 was known to the French. And the fourth member of the fighter collection's Curtis Hawk Quartet, based here at Duxford, of course, is a Battle of France veteran Hawk 75. When World War II started in the Pacific Theatre with the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in December 1941, P-36s, like the one leading this formation, and indeed P-40B and C models, were among the US Army Air Corps fighters stationed on Hawaii that sought in vain to help beat off the Japanese attack. Well, in fact, regrettably, it looks as though we're going to be reduced to a two-ship for this opening display because a technical snag has affected the P-40C, which is the aircraft that just overflew us there. And so that's now going to be coming straight back round and landing. The other two, as I said, running in for the start of the show at half past six.
So there is the P40C safely back on the ground. Very much the sensible thing for any pilot to do in these circumstances if they detect that something isn't quite right with their aeroplane. Of course, discretion, absolutely the better part of valour and the decision taken to not display but instead come in for a precautionary landing. But with that safely accomplished and the aircraft able to taxi back in under its own power, we'll be able to get the show underway as planned in just a few minutes time. And as if on cue, the sun emerges and we do indeed have a stunning skyscape for the start of our display today. Once again, on behalf of the Imperial War Museums, a very warm welcome to this, our third Duxford Flying Evening. You're all very welcome. Hope you've had a great day with us so far. It's about to get even better with the start of a wonderful, just about two hours of evening flying, including a selection of the based warbirds, a few delightful visitors, and to end the show, a spectacular pyrotechnic display from Airborne Pyrotechnics with their Grob G109B duo. A chance to see Duxford in a whole different light. This is one of those venues that, well of course we always see outstanding flying here, but the orientation of the airfield means that for a flying evening, the sun, if it emerges like it has done just now, is behind us. 
So no staring into the blazing light. And in this still evening air, we're expecting to see some marvellous flying displays kicking off with now two of the three Curtis fighters from the fighter collection that got airborne earlier. TFC, one of the prime airworthy collections of privately owned aircraft based here at Duxford and which have added such richness to the scene here over the past five decades of air display flying here under the auspices of the Imperial War Museums. And there is no other collection in the world which boasts such a range of different Curtis types as the fighter collection. They've had many of them pass through their hands over the years. There are now four, the Hawk 75, the P-36C, the P-40C and the P-40F, of which, as I mentioned, we'll now be seeing two to open the display. And they're about to run in now to kick off the flying at the IWM Duxford Flying Evening for 2023. A quite beautiful pair of, in some ways, relatively unsung Second World War fighters, but both types that made an outstanding contribution in different theatres, The engine note rising, the aircraft approaching, and here they come to start our show. Look to the left, we've got the Curtis P-36C and P-40F. On what became known as America's Day of Infamy, 
the 7th of December 1941, a pilot from the US Army Air Corps 46th Pursuit Squadron named 2nd Lieutenant Philip Rasmussen was woken up in his barracks at Wheeler Field, Hawaii by the sound of aircraft overhead and he witnessed the Japanese attack. He attached a .45 caliber pistol to his pajamas and went over to his aeroplane, a Curtis P-36, just like this. Many of the fighters based at Wheeler Field had already been destroyed, but two P-36s and four P-40Cs had already launched. Rasmussen and three other pilots from his squadron took off in their P-36As. Rasmussen's was in a natural metal finish, just like this one again. They engaged formations of Japanese D-3A VAL dive bombers and A-6M-0 fighters. Between them, the P-36ers that went up that day shot down two VALs and one Zero. One of their P-36ers, however, was lost, and Rasmussen's nearly fell victim to Japanese attentions, making it back to Wheeler Field with 500 bullet holes in the airframe. It wasn't an especially fast fighter, the P-36, but it was strong and agile, and when the Hawk 75 models of France's Armée de l'Air came up against the Luftwaffe, they found they were able to outturn the Messerschmitt Bf-109s. No wonder they were so well liked by many of their pilots. In many ways, the P-36, or the Model 75, was the first really modern American production monoplane fighter. And a direct line can be traced from that aircraft to the one we see now running in from the left, the P-40. The P-40 was never the best high-altitude fighter, but when it came into service, and again we're talking a type that entered combat in the relatively early stages of World War II, it had a long range, and it was very manoeuvrable at low level, as well as being an extremely tough aeroplane with a strong airframe and a stable gun platform. And that was borne out by the theatres of war in which P-40s excelled. They were used in great numbers by the RAF in the Middle East and North Africa, both in the air-to-air -air and the air-to-ground roles. 
the Soviets flew them with great distinction on the Eastern Front. And they were flown in significant quantities in the Pacific Theatre as well by the Americans and by the New Zealanders. P-40s achieved air superiority for the Allies in the CBI, the China-Burma-India Theatre. Perhaps their most significant successes, though, were in the Mediterranean, in North Africa, and the Middle East, flown by Americans, Britons, Australians, and South Africans. In total, 46 British and Commonwealth pilots achieved A status in P-40s. This is a P-40F model, powered by the Packard-built version of the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine, the only one of this type flying in Europe and it's in the colours of a P-40F flown in the Italian theatre by the US Army Air Forces in 1944. about to turn in for its final pass. Merlin engines, whether built by Packard or Rolls-Royce, were in relatively short supply, so in fact the last P-40 variants to be built switched back to the Allison V1710 engine, which powered the P-40C that we saw briefly flying earlier. But this is a very, very rare bird indeed these days. And just like the gorgeous natural metal silver so highly polished on the P36C that's taxiing in, so that desert camouflage on the P40F really looks a treat against the sky that we have at the moment. Here comes the P36C then, taxiing back in, flown for us by Rolf Meum, former Royal Norwegian Air Force fighter pilot and someone who's been active on the warbird scene on both sides of the Atlantic for more than 40 years now. He started flying historic aircraft when he was undertaking his flying training with the US Air Force. And as the aircraft taxi passed, you do show your appreciation to the pilots in recognition of their efforts. Meantime, we've got the Spitfire and the B-17 running up at the motorway end, the left-hand end of the airfield as we look out towards the runway, and the tiny cosmic wind air racer has just burst into life right in front of us here at the control tower. It's the P-40F now approaches over the motorway to land.
And there, Brian Smith completing his sequence in the P40F. And that is just always a real sight to savour. A Mark 1 Spitfire against the Duxford skyline. And here it goes, taking off to go and hold. That'll be back with us as the third item on this evening's programme. But here's our next act, about to get underway from the hard runway. No question at all that this aeroplane is one of the most beloved historic aeroplanes on the European circuit these days, not least because it's now the sole airworthy example in Europe of one of the most important heavy bombers to serve on the Allied side during the Second World War. And it is, of course, an aeroplane with a tremendous connection with this part of the world because they were based in their hundreds at stations across East Anglia with the US 8th Air Force and now running straight in to start its display the majestic sight of the Boeing B-17G flying fortress named Sally B.
Sally B always operated as a flying memorial to the countless airmen of the US Army Air Forces who served and who died while operating from East Anglia during the Second World War. And of course, as I'm sure many of you will be aware, it bears on one side the nose art of Memphis Bell, the B-17 that crew was officially credited with being the first to complete a full operational tour of 25 sorties in the European theatre, and it did so 80 years ago this year. In fact, the crew of the original Memphis Bell, headed by Captain Robert Morgan, was subject to regular changes of personnel during the aircraft's time operating in Europe, and Morgan's crew actually notched up 29 sorties. The chances of getting close to that figure, given the hazards of enemy action on the daylight raids the B-17s and their compatriots, the B-24 Liberators, flew over occupied Europe, were very slender indeed. And it's the countless stories of heroism on the part of B-17 crews that are a strong contributor to the sheer potency of Sally B's role as a flying memorial today. These aircraft were able to withstand an incredible degree of punishment, whether from enemy fighters or from German flak defences, and still somehow make it back to East Anglia. In some cases, they weren't able to get back to these parts and force landed in areas further south, near the south coast, as they returned. Nonetheless, in spite of this aircraft's legendary survivability, many of them and their crews were lost on operations. And it's to them in particular that Sally B offers its salute, and it offers its own salute on this final pass with smoke on to simulate two damaged engines to the members of the Sally B Supporters Club. That's the organisation whose efforts help keep this aircraft flying. This aeroplane, don't forget, is entirely privately operated from here at Duxford by B-17 Preservation, headed up, as always, by the irrepressible Ellie Salingbow, without whom this aircraft would have left these shores so many years ago. But it's also thanks to many of you, Duxford Airshow goers, that it's able to keep going. This aircraft has had its ups and downs over the years, only earlier this season it was grounded for a time to uh, enable a Federal Aviation Administration mandated inspection to be undertaken of the airframe. All was found to be in tip-top condition and Sally B was able, albeit a little late, to resume flying this season and we're very, very glad that it was able to. Sallyb.org.uk is where you can go to join the supporters club. 
because this aircraft is, of course, dependent upon charitable donations as well as certain sponsorships in order to keep airworthy because operating a four-engined heavy bomber in civilian hands is no cheap business. Well, our two tiny air racers have taken their positions out on the grass and the hard runways. And there, starting its takeoff roll on the hard, is the tiniest machine in today's display. That's the Cosmic Wind. And that's going to be followed off by the reproduction Mugull. And they'll be back with us in a little bit. Sally B then into land immaculately flown by Peter Kuypers with co-pilot Paul Schluer. But for our next act, we're looking out for the only airworthy aeroplane in the Imperial War Museum's collection and another very notable and indeed exceptional survivor. A Spitfire that went into combat on just one day in May 1940 flying with the then Duxford-based number 19 squadron. It did so in the hands of the unit's then commanding officer, squadron leader Geoffrey Stevenson, but having shot down a Junkers U87 Stuka dive bomber on a sortie to cover the opening phases of Operation Dynamo, the evacuation of the British Expeditionary Force from the beaches of Dunkirk, Stevenson's Spitfire was itself shot down by a Luftwaffe fighter. Stevenson survived the forced landing and was taken prisoner, not least spending a period of time imprisoned in Colditz Castle. The Spitfire sank under the sand until it was recovered many years later and its remains subject to the most outstanding resurrection in the workshops here of the Aircraft Restoration Company and Historic Flying. In 2015, this aeroplane was transferred to the ownership of Imperial War Museums. It's flown as a lasting tribute to the exploits of number 19 squadron, a unit associated with Duxford for many years, and in particular on this aircraft, running in to start its display from the right, the Supermarine Spitfire 1A.
here with number 19 squadron and that began an association that continues to this day with more spitfires in private hands based here than has ever been the case before and if you enjoyed that well come along here again saturday 16th sunday 17th of september for our battle of britain air show when you'll be able to see this aircraft and many many other spitfires of many many other marks taking to the air in commemoration of the events of the summer of 1940. Hurricanes as well, of course, and many other warbirds. Buy your tickets now from the IWM website. and a quintessential Spitfire curved approach into land there. The view over the nose in these aircraft is not great, so the pilots like, if possible, to be able to carry out that curved approach to uh, keep the runway in sight for as long as possible before rounding out. And that was a gorgeous example. Martin Overall at the controls of the IWM Spitfire 1A. Well now very much a homegrown display team taking to the runway, again to uh, go off and hold round to the north prior to their slot in the programme. We've got the Yakovlev Yak 18T leading a pair of Yak 52s together, they form the Flying Comrades and they'll be back with us in a bit. But now it's to the world of air racing that we turn and two aeroplanes that in their own respective ways were absolutely legends of that sport both before World War II and after and in very different forms of air racing one a British design The other from the pen of a notable American. The smallest aircraft in today's show, but my goodness, their performance more than makes up for that. And here they come, the first of them to come through is the Levere Cosmic Wind, that's the post-war American design and it's followed through by the pre-war British designed Percival Mugull. Both of these aircraft, no compromisers designs with air racing in mind. In the case of the Mugull, 
In the early 1930s, handicap air racing and record-breaking flights were increasing in their popularity, and Percival's Gull series of aircraft was already performing well. But Percival decided they wanted to make a more specialised machine for that job, and the Mew Gull was it. By contrast, the Levere Cosmic Wind, designed by the Lockheed test pilot Tony Levere, came about after World War II when he wanted a new racing aeroplane to compete in the Goodyear class of what was known as Formula One air racing. And he and a team drawn from the staff of Lockheed, with which, as I say, Levere was a test pilot, but also he was an air racer in his own right. They worked in six separate garages around Los Angeles to come up with this design. Now, the Goodyear class rules were very simple. Maximum engine size was just 190 cubic inches. The wing loading was to be no more than 12 pounds per square foot, and the airframe had to be able to withstand 6G. Now, the first ever cosmic wind flew in July 1947, and it was powered by a Continental engine producing just 85 horsepower. The aircraft named Ballerina was the third one, which was built for a Lockheed flight test engineer called Glenn Fulkerson, and it was named Ballerina because his wife was exactly that. And it made its debut the following year in 1948 US National Air Races. Later, Ballerina came to the UK. That was in the early 1960s. And while it suffered an accident in 1966, it has been rebuilt and the result is what we see here. And as we can see, it's not just an extremely rapid air racer, it has the most phenomenal aerobatic performance. Even so, it was a bit of a surprise when the great display aerobatic and test pilot Neil Williams entered it in the 1964 World Aerobatic Championships in Bilbao. And this is in spite of the fact that this aircraft just isn't suitable, really, for competition aerobatics. It was too fast for a start, so it used up a lot of sky, and competition aerobatics take place inside a very restricted aerobatic box. So that was one problem he had to uh, overcome. The low-powered engine meant it took a lot of time for the aircraft to regain its energy during a potent aerobatic sequence, and the inverted fuel system that was then fitted to the aeroplane was makeshift and almost useless, so Williams had to turn the fuel system on and off constantly during his sequences. Even so, he performed incredibly well. It later flew in British Formula One air racing in the 1970s, when the sport enjoyed a brief renaissance over here, sponsored by such notables as Heineken and Southern Organs. And today, it's the only airworthy cosmic wind in the world, though hopefully that situation is soon to change. And would you believe this tiny aeroplane in the 1960s became the subject of an effort by a company called American Electric to build a counterinsurgency aircraft on this platform, which they called the Piranha. Cosmic Wind then coming round for its last pass. This aircraft was just refinished at the start of this season. It looks absolutely immaculate, and I can't wait to see it uh, flying with uh, one, possibly two other Cosmic Winds in the not too distant future. Here, diving in from the left, comes the Mugal. The first Mugal made its debut in 1934, and a total of six of them went on to be built. 
This one, as I've mentioned, is an absolutely beautiful and exact reproduction of one of the pre-war originals which didn't survive. The aircraft this reproduction represents was rebuilt after a mishap by its manufacturer Percival for a new owner named Charles Gardner who later became the BBC's air correspondent and with it Gardner won the 1937 King's Cup race. And it was his second King's Cup win in succession because he won it the previous year in a Percival Viga Gull. Later that Mew Gull was bought by Jim Mollison, who of course married the well-known aviator Amy Johnson for a long-distance record attempt, but that was cancelled when war broke out in 1939, and that Mugal was eventually destroyed in a German air raid on Lim Aerodrome in Kent. Much later, David Beale decided to build this accurate reproduction in its 1936-37 form. He used structural drawings, undertook a great deal of research of photos, documents and period articles on the original. And he used exactly the right materials and components as were used in the authentic machine. It's got an ash, spruce and ply structure with aluminium cowlings and wheel spats. And incredibly, the aircraft runs on an original 1936 de Havilland Gypsy Queen engine, which had only been run for six hours from new when David bought it for the project. And he, it was found when the aircraft entered flight testing that it performs exactly as per the Certificate of Airworthiness test flight reports from 1936 and 38. Of course, the most famous of all Mew Gulls was the one that the great test pilot Alex Henshaw used to set a new record for a flight from the UK to Cape Town and back in 1939. A flight he undertook in four days, 10 hours and 16 minutes for the round trip, including a 28-hour layover in Cape Town. Quite incredible performance. And that's especially the case when you think that Henshaw was flying into remote airstrips at night with just the most rudimentary navigational aids at his disposal and that he was suffering from a severe fever on the outward leg. That aircraft still survives today in the ownership of the Shuttleworth collection. And to be able to see that original on occasions, flying with this reproduction, really has been quite outstanding. Indeed, we saw it here at the Duxford Air Festival back in May 2017. The aircraft coming in then for its last pass. And here it comes for the final time, the Percival Mugull. The aircraft owned and indeed flown today by the man who built it, David Beale. He keeps it at a farm strip out near Ely and he's heading back there now.
And there, into land, is Cosmic Wind Ballerina, which was flown for us by its owner, Pete Kinsey, a former British aerobatic champion, and doesn't it show in his handling of that titchy little machine. One of my favourite historic aircraft. OK, well, with the cosmic wind on the ground and the Mughal heading back home, we look out now to the right for our next display. And it's really nice to see some team aerobatics at this event. And it comes from a team that's been gradually expanding its repertoire since they first came onto the airshow circuit a couple of seasons ago. And the aircraft leading this trio might look a bit of an unlikely machine to be flying aerobatics, but my word, it has some capability. Running in to start their show, we've got the Flying Comrades with the Yakovlev Yak-18T and two Yak-52s. So starting with an initial loop, which uh, we had rather hoped would have the sun glinting off their wings, but unfortunately it's gone behind a cloud for the moment. The AK-18T leading is really an outstanding touring aeroplane, but it also has this excellent aerobatic capability. It saw some service when it was first brought out in the then Soviet Union as a training aircraft for pilots from the then Soviet national airline Aeroflot. And on its wings, one of the most familiar Soviet-designed aircraft in the West, the Yak-52, which was produced in quantity in Romania. It's Phil Hardesty leading the team in the Yak-18T. Phil started out on the display circuit in 2019, flying the Piper Cub. He's since progressed on to a variety of historic aircraft. Regular sight at the Duxford shows in uh, chipmunks, cubs and so forth, as well as in the Yaks. And he works as a commercial airline pilot. Now, in the aircraft that's at the top of the formation, the one with the yellow elements to the colour scheme, is Comrade 2, Alex Luton. He's also a commercial pilot. And at the controls of the aircraft that was nearest to us, on that pass is Tom Turner, who works as the head of airfield here at IWM Duxford and is a long-standing vintage aircraft and display pilot. So there they transitioned into line astern. And they're now putting the smoke back on as they run back in from the right. Still in line astern. And Phil Hardesty calling the shots as they all roll to the right.
and they're now going to be rejoining in echelon right. Always a really distinctive engine note accompanying these yaks. A 400 horsepower Vedenev M14 PF nine cylinder radial powering the Yak 18T that leads this formation. These aircraft started coming onto the Western circuit en masse in the early 1990s with the dissolution of the Eastern Bloc. And it's really not hard to see why. An excellent uh, touring aeroplane, whether in the uh, Yak 18T form or the Yak 52, but with this aerobatic capability. The Yak 52 is a derivative of the earlier single seat tailwheel equipped Yak 50, although there have been tail dragger versions of the Yak 52 produced as well. And it was intended as a basic trainer for the Soviet paramilitary flying tra training organization, DOSAF. And one interesting feature of the Yak-52, which you might have noticed as the aircraft uh, fly past, is that the main undercarriage legs don't retract fully into the wings when the undercarriage is retracted, which is quite a useful feature given the occasional propensity of student pilots to land without lowering the undercarriage. And all of these aircraft are of simple, rugged construction, very much in the Soviet traditions. The Yak-18T has a fabric-covered tailplane, elevators and rudder. Most of the structure is made of riveted alloy panels, and the wing centre section is a conventional all-metal construction. And more than a thousand of them were built, most of them, when production resumed to meet Western orders at the Yakovlev factory in Smolensk in 1993, because this was an aircraft that had originally appeared back in 1967. And the Yak-52 continues that ruggedness. The engine starter, the flaps, the brakes and the undercarriage are all operated by pneumatics. And following that final loop, we're going to see them going round to the south and positioning in on what we refer to as the B-axis, that's the one at 90 degrees to the main runway, for their final break.
And so the leader calling smoke on to his colleagues. And here they come rolling out head on to us. Ready to make their break. And there they go, the 2023 Flying Comrades. And thank you very much to Phil Hardesty, to Alex Luton and to Tom Turner. And special thanks as ever with their displays to Alex's father, Nigel, who owns two of the three aircraft that we see displaying there. Oh, well, regrettably, we've just heard from the tower that the Hawker Fury, which we were to have seen as part of one of our next items, is going to have to shut down due to an engine snag. So, sorry about that. But once again, there's absolutely no need to take any chances in these circumstances. So the Fury taxiing off to shut down. So we're actually going to bring the yaks into land first now. And the flying comrades that we've just seen among the acts at our Battle of Britain Air Show on Saturday 16th and Sunday the 17th of September alongside, as I was saying earlier, the cream of the warbird crop. Well, our only jet on the programme now is going to be flying solo. It was to have flown with the Fury. And once we've got this into the air, the Catalina will be following it off.
And there goes the Catalina to be back with us in a few minutes' time. For the next display we turn to the very start of the jet age and an aircraft type that was the second ever operational jet with the Royal Air Force and which ushered in jet power for a good many overseas air arms as well. And a very good look there at the twin boom layout that was adopted for this aircraft as it positions for its display. And this was chosen to make the jet pipe from the engine that much shorter and minimise the loss of thrust from the single engine because this was also the first operational single jet aircraft. And it's an aeroplane of interesting construction. De Havilland, of course, had a great deal of experience of wooden aircraft, most famously the Mosquito. And the structure of this aeroplane is a mixture of wood and metal. The fuselage pod has a balsa wood core with layers of birch veneer inside and outside of that. But the wings, the tail booms and the tail are all of metal. And this was an outstandingly successful aeroplane and by all accounts an absolutely delightful one to fly. Just too late to see World War II service but it achieved many notable feats for jet aircraft in the early post-war years. In it comes over the motorway end from the Norwegian Air Force Historical Squadron, the de Havilland Vampire FB6. And that engine is a single de Havilland Goblin 3 turbojet of around 3,350 pounds of thrust. What were those firsts that I was talking about that the Vampire notched up? Well, perhaps most famously, that great test pilot, Captain Eric Winkle Brown, used a Mark I Vampire to make the first ever carrier, aircraft carrier landing and takeoff in a jet. That was aboard the aircraft carrier HMS Ocean on the 3rd of December 1945 and it followed on that the Sea Vampire became the first jet aircraft in service with the fleet air arm of the Royal Navy. And then, 75 years ago, last month, in July of 1948, Vampires from number 54 Squadron became the first jet aircraft of all to carry out a flight across the Atlantic Ocean. They just beat some US Air Force Lockheed F-80 shooting stars to that accolade. And that summer, number 54 Squadron's Vampires, which formed the world's first jet aerobatic team, carried out memorable displays in the United States. So too did a Sea Vampire from the Royal Navy alongside Hawker Sea Furies, one of which we were to have seen represented by the Fury, and de Havilland Sea Hornets.
British Aviation, therefore, enjoyed excellent representation at events across the North American continent that summer. Vampire served extensively with RAF units around the world in all sorts of roles. Back home, the T-11 trainer was the first jet aircraft on which RAF pilots gained their wings at the last stage of the flying training school syllabus. And the first station to use the Vampire for that training purpose wasn't far from here at RAF Oakington. This one comes to us from our friends at the Norwegian Air Force Historical Squadron. The Royal Norwegian Air Force operated 62 Vampires as its first jet fighters. This one's actually an ex-Swiss Air Force aircraft. The Swiss didn't retire their last Vampires until the early 1990s. But continuing the international flavour, for this season, the Norwegian Air Force Historical Squadron has repainted this aircraft in Italian Air Force colours. That's because it's the centenary of the formation of the Italian Air Force, and they've chosen the markings of the 6th Stormo and 154th Gruppo, named the Diavoli Rossi, or the Red Devils. That unit operated the Vampire when it reformed in 1952 and today it flies the Panavia Tornado from Gedi. And so it was a real pleasure for the Norwegian Air Force Historical Squadron when this aircraft was lined up at the Royal International Air Tattoo at Fairford earlier this season, which also commemorated the Italian Air Force centenary, next to a tornado from the modern-day unit whose squadron markings this vampire today carries. And having mentioned how the RAF's first jet aerobatic team flew vampires, so did the Italian Air Forces. The team called the Cavallini Rampanti, or the Wild Horses, flew vampires. is just a delightful aeroplane. The uh, historical squadron based at Ruka in Norway, but they always deploy at least one of their aeroplanes across to the UK for the summer air show season. This year it's the Vampire. They're not operating their MiG-15 this year. The aircraft spends quite a bit of its time here at Duxford between appearances around the country Back home, the historical squadron flies at displays as well, but also at Royal Norwegian Air Force commemorations. And their two-seat vampire, which we've seen here in the past, was operating once again, as it's done for a few years earlier this year, with the Finnish Air Force for use as part of their test pilot school course, because one of the historical squadron's other pilots, Yuri Matila, is the Finnish Air Force's chief test pilot. They like to, of course, as all test pilot schools do, expose trainee test pilots to a wide variety of different aircraft types to train them in as many different characteristics, both flying systems and so forth, as possible. And so an agreement's been reached to use the uh, historical squadron Vampire T-55. And it deployed over to Finland earlier this summer, but that was the single seat Vampire FB-6 from the Norwegian Air Force historical squadron, and it was flown ever so elegantly by that organization's founder, Kenneth Orkvistler. But now, before we move on to our next display, it's necessary, regrettably, to 
talk about one of those sorts of things that one never likes to reflect on, but which sometimes are unavoidable. The loss of a much-loved name from the air display circuit. I'm talking about Trevor Bailey, one of the pilots from the Great War display team who tragically lost his life earlier this week in an aircraft accident. Trevor was a stalwart of the display circuit for many seasons, not least working for Air Atlantique's Classic Flight and Classic Air Force, supporting their fleet of post-war aeroplanes, displaying his own Oster T7 and flying an SE5A replica in the Great War display team. He was a delightful fellow, steeped in vintage aviation, full of knowledge, full of support and full of friendship. And we use this display by the plain sailing consolidated PBY5A Catalina to pay tribute to Trevor Bailey. Trevor, we'll all miss you. As for the Catalina itself, it was devised as a new patrol bomber for the United States Navy as Japanese threats in the Pacific began to burgeon through the 1930s. It made its first flight in 1935 and this was a really advanced design for that era. As you can see, this example, which as I said is a PBY-5A, is an amphibian. That's what the A stands for in the designation. The early Catalinas were pure flying boats. That enormous wing houses fuel tankage, which means there's no need for drag-inducing external fuel tanks, and it helps keep the airframe design that much slipperier. And also reducing the drag is the use of the retractable wingtip floats. These aircraft flew gallantly in pretty much every single theatre of World War II. With the RAF, they were a crucial weapon in the Battle of the Atlantic. And some of the most famous actions by Royal Air Force Coastal Command of the war years were carried out by Catalinas. Their first big success came in 1941 when a Catalina from number 209 squadron stationed on Loch Erne in Northern Ireland sighted the German battleship Bismarck off the French port of Brest. That and another Catalina from number 240 squadron shadowed the Bismarck until naval vessels were back in the vicinity, those including of course HMS Ark Royal, from which a fairy swordfish torpedo bomber of the fleet air arm flew to deliver the final blow.
RAF Catalinas covered the Allied landings in North Africa, operating out of Gibraltar. And over very different waters, they protected supply convoys flying from a base close to the Soviet port of Murmansk. And it was a Catalina that undertook the last Coastal Command U-boat sinking of the war, northeast of Sullum Vaux in the Shetlands, on the 7th of May 1945, just one day before VE Day brought World War II in Europe to a close. And in 1944 alone, two Catalina pilots who were assigned to Royal Air Force Coastal Command were awarded the Victoria Cross, both of them for continuing attacks against German U-boats in the face of incredibly heavy fire. One of them was Flying Officer John Cruikshank of number 210 Squadron, who was hit in 72 places on his body and his navigator was killed. Yet the second pilot managed to undertake most of the flight back from the middle of the North Atlantic to Sullum Vaux in the Shetlands, which takes about five hours in a Catalina. This in spite of the fact that that second pilot was also injured in the engagement. This aircraft, operated by plane sailing from Duxford, represents an OA-10A a rescue version used by the US Army Air Forces for air sea rescue duties out of Halesworth in Suffolk in 1945. The OA-10A Catalina, represented by the colour scheme on this one from plain sailing, was named Miss Pickup, reflecting its rescue role, before it was lost in a rescue sortie off the Dutch coast in April, or late March, early April 1945. And the loss of that aeroplane along with all the others of US military aircraft that flew from the UK during World War II is commemorated by the Counting the Cost memorial sculpture on the roadway leading into the American Air Museum. Silhouettes of all those hundreds of aeroplanes are emblazoned on there with the details of the units and the bases that they came from and the original Miss Pickup is one of them. This was a Canadian built Catalina actually known as a Canso to the Canadians And it's plain sailing's pleasure for the aircraft's display at our show this evening to be dedicated, as I mentioned earlier, to the memory of the late Trevor Bailey. Flying the PVY for us today, in the captain's seat, Angelo Cunningham, very experienced Irish display pilot and flying instructor, and his co-pilot was Richie Piper.
Just a couple of items left on the bill for this evening. And our grand finale act is about to line up on the grass to take off in formation and go and position ready for what promises to be an absolutely marvellous conclusion to this evening. And to facilitate them getting airborne on time, because of course we need to make sure that we finish the show punctually this evening with the onset of official darkness. We're just going to hold the Catalina there to enable the two Grob G109Bs of airborne pyrotechnics to take off and go in position. But about to get airborne is our final solo act of the show. And perhaps the most famous fighting aeroplane of the First World War from either side, certainly as far as the Imperial German Air Service was concerned. And here it is, the one-time mount of the Red Baron himself, the Fokker DR1 Dreidecker, the triplane. This design came about in significant part because of the excellent performance of the British Sopwith triplane when it first appeared. It was designed not by Anthony Fokker himself, but by Reinhold Platz. And it was gradually developed into production form, and the Red Baron, Manfred von Richthofen, became an early advocate of the triplane. 
Likewise, his counterpart Werner Foss, although Foss was killed in one of the pre-production triplanes in September 1917 in combat against SE-5As of number 56 squadron over Flanders. The first unit to receive the DR-1 was Jagdgeschwader 1, or Fighter Wing 1, which was under von Richthofen's command. In spite of this aircraft's fame, which has come about over the years in no small part because of the exploits of uh, von Richthofen himself, it was built in very small numbers. Just 320 DR-1s were produced. This is, of course, a more modern replica with a more modern engine, 185 horsepower four-cylinder Lycoming. The original had 110 horsepower Le Rhone or Oberursel nine-cylinder rotary. As far as its performance was concerned, this aircraft was incredibly agile in turns, although it was slower than its Allied adversaries. Von Richthofen himself was quoted as saying of the DR-1, it climbed like a monkey and manoeuvred like the devil. He scored only his last 19 aerial victories in DR1s, most of them he'd achieved in Albatross scouts, as they were known, the D2 and the D3. It was, of course, in his last red DR1 that he was shot down near Vaux-sur-Somme on the 21st of April 1918, while the aircraft was in combat with Sopwith Camels from number 209 squadron. Although it's now generally believed that ground fire from Australian anti-aircraft forces was more than likely responsible for the kill. Why were so few triplanes built? Well, in large part because of serious structural problems with the original airframes, especially wing failures. Fokker had the D7 biplane coming along as well. The problems with the DR1 really put it into relatively early retirement in favour of the less troublesome D7. And by October 1918, a month before the eventual armistice that brought World War I to a close, only about 10 triplanes were left in service with frontline units of the Imperial German Air Service. Others had been relegated to home defence training and so forth. This one was built from scratch, this replica by Paul and Sarah Ford, using plans that were supplied by Ron Sands. It took more than five years for Paul and Sarah to complete it to the desired standards of accuracy, but it first flew from Sywell in Northamptonshire in April 2008. And it's finished, appropriately enough, as one of Manfred von Richthofen's triplanes from Jagdstaffel, or Jasta, Fighter Squadron 11 the aircraft in which he scored nine of his 80 kills, up to and including his 78th. And against the moon, it's about to come in for its last pass. Well, in fact, it looks like it's now coming into land. Yes. 
And that was Paul Ford in his Fokker DR1 Dreidecker. A man with a long association with Duxford, Paul. He started here as a volunteer back in the 1970s. And he's now a regular fixture here once again. Paul's a mechanical engineer by profession. He spent many years at the University of Cambridge Department of Engineering. And I expect to see his uh, First World War aircraft fleet expand with a very interesting machine in the not too distant future, which we'll also see here. But now we're getting ready for the final item on today's programme. There's been a huge growth in Britain in the past few seasons of display acts able to fly as night approaches with pyrotechnics attached to the airframes and very impressive LED lighting and it's with another of those that we bring this evening to a close. You might be able to spot the two aircraft with their LEDs on out in front of us. A team that comes to us from a farm strip down in Wiltshire and it's flown by a father and son. Tim and Tom Dews, respectively. Tim also has a long history in relation to Duxford. He grew up flying models from this aerodrome. And he started at the age of 16 an apprenticeship repairing gliders. And he's been involved with gliders and motorised gliders ever since. And what we're about to enjoy to close our show is a routine of the very highest standards, flying a pair of Grob G109Bs running in at altitude, ready to first of all put their smoke generators on There goes the smoke on to start the display, concluding the IWM Duxford flying evening for 2023 by Airborne Pyrotechnics. And that's their heart, their salute to all of you here at Duxford this evening.
and how better to complete our display than with that. Airborne Pyrotechnics, Tim and Tom Dews with the two Grob G109Bs. A marvellous display. Thank you so much to both Tim and Tom for coming and joining our flying evening for the first time here at Duxford. Tim's been involved for many years with the charity Aerobility, which helped disabled people fly. And at the opening ceremony in 2012 for the Paralympics in London, he helped fit pyrotechnics to a twin-engine Technam aircraft, which was flown over London by a disabled pilot. They then, later that year, put the pyrotechnics on one of the Grob 109s for a short display three years later. Airborne Pyrotechnics display team was formed. I think you'll agree, they're a spectacular addition to the scene. The Grob G109 with that 17.5 metre wingspan. You can see the two aircraft both had heart NHS lit up under their wings in tribute to the efforts of the National Health Service during the pandemic. They'll be coming back round to land and that'll be the final act of our display this evening and I'm sure both Tim and Tom as they taxi back into park would appreciate knowing just how much you enjoyed that wonderful display. While we wait for the aircraft to land a word about upcoming events here at Duxford not just about the flying displays of course we've got a series of Battle of Britain themed events coming up September very much being Battle of Britain month IWM Duxford in conversation Battle of Britain is on the 9th of September with lectures from guest speakers and IWM experts all about the events of the summer of 1940 there'll be Spitfires and Hurricanes on display to get up close to tickets cost £40 for that including general admission to the museum from the 9th to the 15th of September there are Battle of Britain tours in the expert hands of an IWM WM guide for a 60 minute tour exploring Duxford's role during the battle and a lot of the history that surrounds it along with an exclusive tour of the operations room. Tickets for that cost £10 not including general admission and they'll be running daily these tours at 2pm between the 9th and 15th of September. Then on the weekend of Saturday 16th, Sunday 17th of September, it is our Duxford Battle of Britain air show with Spitfires and Hurricanes filling the skies along with many, many other warbirds. All the details of that, including how to get hold of your advance tickets, are on the website. Then it's IWM Duxford presents Battle of Britain, the movie with the historian Dilip Sarkar. That is on the 23rd of September and this includes an exclusive screening of the film which I'm sure many of you will know was filmed in large part at this very airfield in 1968. Tickets for this cost £30 and include general admission and then concluding these activities IWM Duxford in a different light, Battle of Britain one for the photographers amongst you, an after-hours photography evening with lighting, living history actors, Spitfires, Hurricanes and so forth, and the aircraft restoration company's Westland Lysander performing an engine run at sundown. And then, finishing the display season here, we'll be marking 50 years of IWM Duxford Air Shows, half a century to the day since the first one, Saturday the 14th of October. IWM.org.uk is the place to book tickets for all of these and discover more about other activities going on here at the museum. But here come our final performers of the evening into land. How about this? A formation landing in near darkness. about to settle onto the grass once again I give you Tim and Tom Dews well thank you all so much for your appreciation of that and the other displays and thank you all above all for coming to the IWM Duxford Flying Evening for 2023 it's been our pleasure to bring this event to you don't forget the hangars that we've had open this evening namely Hangar 4, the American Air Museum and Airspace remain open until 9pm 
and I can already see some very nice coloured lighting illuminating the Handley Page Victor up in the airspace hangar for one thing. But as the last vestiges of light disappear to the north, it's time to bid farewell from me, Ben Dunnell, to all of you. It's been great talking to you this evening. Join us again in just a few weeks for the IWM Duxford Battle of Britain Air Show and enjoy the rest of this long bank holiday weekend. So from me and all of the IWM Duxford flying events team, including our flying display director, Matt Wilkins, it's goodbye. Thank you very much and see you soon. What a gorgeous afternoon that was, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, got the lights in places. Didn't we? I'm sort of speaking in hushed tones because the whole airfields felt so still all evening. There was zero wind at all. And uh, very atmospheric there with a bit of music going on across the show site here, which we can't bring to you for rights reasons, unfortunately. Um, but made for a really nice atmosphere uh, for the final display there, Airborne Pyrotechnics. Tim and Tom putting on a smashing display. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, if, you enjoy, if you've enjoyed what you've seen, do subscribe. We'll be live next week. It is next week, isn't it, from Bournemouth um, for four days, and there will be some night air, some similar displays to that that you've just seen at Bournemouth. So, yeah, do subscribe to here, on here on YouTube. You can even you can tick the little bell to get a notification when we go live if you like. But even better than that, you can sign up below to our email newsletter. I did manage to send one out today to remind everybody that we were going live. So sign up to the email newsletter. There's a link in the description. And uh, yeah, hopefully I'll uh, get an email out with links to the live broadcasts. You can always give this video a like and do share it to other people you think might enjoy it as well. Um, just check the chat to see if there are any questions or anyone, um, any queries. Just everyone saying, Lovely moonshot. It was a good moonshot. We spent the entirety of that display hoping, hoping, hoping we'd get the aircraft flying directly through it. Not quite, but we were nearly there. Um, lots of chat about... Uh, I can see James and Cheryl saying beautiful display. Thanks, Ian. You're very welcome. Thanks a million, says Matthew Lovell. Good stuff. Okay, well, glad to see everyone's enjoying it. And if you do really enjoy what we do, oh, bless you. And I should say a big thank you to Merchant of England for your uh, super chat and New Rail Basher as well. New Rail Basher. Is that a oh, no, I've spent the entirety of the journey up with my old man talking about model model trains, mm. listening to a conversation about modern, model, modern tra model trains. I wonder if you are a railway enthusiast with a username like that. New Rail Basher, thank you for your five pound super chat who's saying thank you for the stream. Well, it's quite late at night. Well, uh, half past eight. We've got to knock down our cameras. We've got to pack the kit that we need for Bournemouth and, uh, yeah, get on the road for Devon from Cambridge. So you'll forgive me if I make it brief and say thank you very much for tuning in and I'll see you again next week. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs>